Slasherholics. This is R.A. Mahailov, Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Keep watching the 80s Slasher Librarian. The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 15 Aaron came to a wire fence and vaulted over it like it was made of matchstick. Hewitt came soon after and tried to force his way through, but collapsed in a thrashing heap of flesh and wire. He cried out as he staggered and fell, his thigh making shocking contact with the impartial horsepower cruelty of the chainsaw. The cutting blades bit into his leg and he screamed, and as the skin of his thigh separated, it became a slick mouth of white fat, porous with vesicles of oozing blood. Blood. Leatherface screamed and thrashed about in the barbed tangle, the engine of the chainsaw matching his cries note for note. Aaron stopped to see what had happened and had to stifle an insane giggle at the sight of the murderous bastard caught up in the wire. He was just stuck there, howling and kicking like he was poor Tommy Hewitt with his skin cancer. Maybe Aunt Henrietta could come along and kiss his big fat whining ass, the stupid bitch. And while she was at it, maybe Henrietta could find a way to bring Jedediah back to life and the teenage girl and all the other poor bastards that they'd all killed. Aaron suddenly remembered the image of the sheriff pouring bourbon onto her face and realized just how much these maniacs needed to suffer. She hoped the wire fence ripped the ugly fuck into shreds, and then she was gone. Twenty, maybe thirty yards on, Aaron stumbled out of the shrubbery and was amazed to find herself standing in the middle of a highway. Her feet were on tarmac. She could hear the chainsaw and Hewitt screaming, but she had found an artery that could take her to anywhere in America. All she needed, the only thing she needed was... An automobile was heading along the road towards her, its headlights like champagne in the darkness of the hour. Aaron ran out and waved her arms, screaming, Stop! She was begging, almost willing the car to free her from this nightmare. The vehicle broke hard, its tires screeching as the driver worked to avoid her. The headlights bore down on Aaron, on her horrified face, on her hands and arms soaked with the blood of others. Help me! She screamed. The lights were on full beam, and they hurt her eyes as she stepped forward and gestured frantically for the car to stop. She had to squint. The car slowed almost to a walking pace, then swerved to avoid her. Stop! But the car just crawled past the screaming, dangerous, blood-stained lunatic and began to pick up speed again. Aaron ran alongside it and pounded on the windows with her bleeding fist, but she couldn't keep up and with the touch of the gas pedal and an automatic shift into third, fourth, and then fifth, the car pulled away, taking all of her hopes with it. You assholes! She cried, but what could she do? If the roles had been reversed, would she have done any different? Oh, God. The teenage girl they'd picked up. And suddenly, Aaron was aware. Aware of her role in a bloody cycle that reached back over decades. In the distance, she could hear the chainsaw kick back into life. 
he would be coming after her again, something she found both terrifying and utterly demoralizing. He had to get tired sooner or later, his clumsy frame wasn't built for running, and the chainsaw had to be heavy. If she could just stay out in front of him, maybe hold out long enough until a car would stop for her. Erin hurried off along the highway, her right knee now ablaze with pain. Leatherface came after her, blood seeping into his pants where the chainsaw had bitten. Cloud was starting to creep its way overhead, but hadn't yet obscured the moon, so Aaron was able to see quite some way along the road, and in the distance she saw a large building. There was a light shining through one of the windows, offering the girl yet another chance of unexpected hope. She ran forward, despondently wishing for a phone, weapon, a place to hide anything, the last place they'd taken refuge in. Morgan's split carcass was still hanging from the chandelier. Her feet kicked up dust, but the chainsaw never quit for a second. As Aaron and her insanguined pursuer loped exhaustedly in the direction of... Oh my god! Aaron stopped. She could see what it was now, and almost immediately that unforgettable reek was upon her. Because the place she was fleeing to, it wasn't just one building. It was a series of buildings all linked and connected by their lethal function. The place she was fleeing to was the slaughterhouse. Though it seemed like a lifetime ago, they'd driven past the slaughterhouse only this morning. She remembered Morgan teasing Pepper and how they'd all reacted to the bad smell. She didn't realize that she had run so far. If anything, the meat processing plant looked even more sinister in the hypnotic moonlight. She could hear the sounds of cattle in the darkness, their voices like the plaintive death cries of lost souls or of mournful ghosts of disembowelment. The fact that Hewitt was chasing her towards the abattoir seemed bloodily opposite, her whole day sandwiched within the bookends of the meat factory. Strip away humanity and all we are left with is meat. Aaron climbed over a wire fence, then hurried forward through the grounds of the slaughterhouse. She practically fell against the wall at the back of the main building, slamming hard against it, with all the fear and lack of control of someone running for her life. She couldn't see any doors or windows, but there was a ramp of some description leading in. The wooden incline smelt of bleach and was a little slippery, but Aaron managed to keep her footing as she ran up. At the top of the ramp, she entered a narrow, claustrophobic passageway that went into the building. Harsh, fluorescent lighting caused her to squint, but she could still see that the floor and walls of the corridor were thick with blood and animal dung, and suddenly she knew exactly where she was. Aaron was standing in the very corridor where thousands of animals had spent their last few terrified seconds on Earth. This is where the livestock came to die. This is where man proved his mastery over nature, and Aaron was sick to her soul of being surrounded by the trappings of death. She could almost feel the Hewitts clawing greedily at her flesh, mouths running with meat juices, stomachs fat with body sauce, their reflex to kill as normal and mindless as taking a shit, her own digested remains becoming nothing more than a good, hard shit. It seemed she would never see an end to the horror that was being heaped upon her. Each time she reached a new limit, those bastards tore it to shreds. It felt as if she was being driven deeper and deeper into a dark pit, where only red meat held sway. At the end of the corridor, she came to a cramped space that was more like an iron box. There was a hatch in one of the walls. I looked through and saw the stunner, the pneumatic device used by the slaughterman to inject a thick metal bolt right between the animal's eyes to render it unconscious before being hoisted up on a chain, stabbed through the aorta, and then bled to death. Aaron was wearing leather shoes and a leather belt. Outside, there was some cattle in a pen. 
On the far side of the pen, Leatherface was cutting through a wire fence with his chainsaw, trying to break into the yard at the back of the slaughterhouse. He knew she was in there. The saw blade tore through the barbed wire like it was cotton candy, but the squill of metal on metal and the thick guttural blast of the gasoline engine sent the enclosed livestock into a panic. The cows began to stamp their hooves, and some of them bellowed with fear. Even at this most primal level, the beasts perceived the violence and inhumanity Leatherface represented, even though their hides were perfectly safe from him. He broke through the fence and lumbered awkwardly through the creatures, slapping them, pushing them aside, and holding the chainsaw up above his head so that it cut like a shark fin through the dark sea of high, ungulate backs, and panic spread out from him among the animals in deafening waves. Aaron could hear the distressed cries coming from the livestock pen. They injected a bolt of cold fear through her heart, reminding her again of the violent maniac at her heels. She was sure he'd love to catch her here inside the revolting knockbox, so that he could put her to sleep where all the other animals died. But there was a side hatch leading out of the metal cubicle, into the slaughterhouse proper, and Aaron was only too glad to see it. She went through and found herself standing inside a cool room with rows and rows of carcasses hanging from tidy steel meat hooks. Here, death had already been water blasted, scrubbed down, and sanitized. The last rites had been administered to these poor creatures with an air knife, and she couldn't help but remember Andy suspended above the broken piano. Would her horror have been any less if the boy had also been stripped, washed, and decapitated? How could she feel revulsion seeing him hanging from a hook with half a leg missing, and yet only feel a slight nervous chill when confronted with all these dismembered animal torsos? Dozens of them. What barrier was there in her mind, and how had old Monty and little Tommy Hewitt broke horn into barbecue ribs? Aaron pushed her hair back behind her ears and ran out across the floor of the giant meat-filled refrigerator. The room was dark, lit only by the moon through dirty slit windows near the ceiling and she had to weave and duck to avoid banging into the spread eagle beef halves. The cold air made goosebumps rise on her skin and turn the filthy sweat and slime on her clothes into ice water. But none of this penetrated the freezing terror that never once relaxed its grip on her will. This night would never end. Leatherface pulled a massive chain that hung from the ceiling. What was that? Aaron could hear some kind of high-pitched rattling sound like a chain. It came from somewhere inside the cooler with her. But where? Suddenly there was a loud crashing sound followed by a constant whirring of mechanical automation. Aaron listened, turned her head to look in all directions. It seemed to be coming from all around her, but she couldn't see a thing. The ceiling! She looked up and saw that a whole lot of machinery had been set in motion. The ceiling was a grid of pulleys and gears, controlling the many conveyors and meat processing systems that helped keep the plant fast and efficient. But who was doing all of this? Was there someone working here, or was it... Something hit Aaron from behind. She screamed and leapt forward, only to see that she'd backed up into an animal carcass. The body was bloody and hanging from a vicious meat hook, but it wasn't Leatherface. Aaron heaved a sigh of relief and was slammed from behind. No, it wasn't possible. Not after she'd come this far. Not now. Not... It was another side of beef. All the carcasses were moving now, their hooks being slowly pulled along by a chain system. And one of them had swung up behind Aaron and struck her hard in the back. She couldn't believe she'd fallen for this twice, but her nerves were in tatters. Suddenly, she had an idea. Maybe she could use the situation to her advantage. 
Hurriedly, she stepped over to the massive side of beef that had just hit her and put her back against it. She let it shield her and walked with it, as it slowly continued on its mechanical way. The hooks all seemed to be headed over in the direction of... The chainsaw ignited and swung through the air towards her. Aaron ducked and felt a rush of air as the saw blade backed through the carcass and took off its leg. The severed limb fell to the floor and Leatherface arched his back in preparation for the return swing that would take her head off. But in avoiding the first attack, Aaron had lost her balance and had now fallen flat onto her back. This bought her two more seconds as the chainsaw came flailing down towards her groin. Quickly, she slid her body back along the stone floor and spread her legs wide so that the saw could land harmlessly between them. The rotating blades should have gutted Aaron there and then, but instead they whipped into an iron drain cover, showering Aaron's groin with sparks. Seizing her chance, Aaron stretched forward and kicked the bastard straight between the legs. Leatherface howled and struggled to disentangle the chainsaw from the metal grid, but he was too slow. Aaron quickly placed her other foot right on his aching balls and pushed off against him, her body sliding. Then barrel rolling beneath the swinging beef carcasses, by the time Leatherface was ready to deal with the girl, she'd already got back onto her feet and started running. But he wasn't defeated yet. The slaughterhouse was his domain, and he knew how to bring the bitch down. Whimpering and whining, Hewitt limped over to a heavy-duty switch set in the wall. Then he opened the throttle on his chainsaw and screamed before burying the switch. The self-cleaning sprinklers kicked in within a flash, and Aaron was running through a crazed downpour of freezing water. It was obvious what he was trying to do. He wanted to distract her, intimidate her, but she didn't care that she was soaking wet, and she made damn sure she didn't slip on the stone floor. Water trickled down the pale pink skin of the dead beef as it swayed back and forth in front of her, but now she was pushing the meat out of her way, and soon she came to a door that opened onto a pitch black stairway. She didn't know where it would lead, but she took it anyway. There was no light at all in the stairwell, so she had to feel her way down, the concrete steps, and then through another door, where she came at last to the main floor of the slaughterhouse. Just like the cold room, the only illumination in this massive hall came from slivers of moonlight struggling to gain entrance through a row of dirty windows high up in the 20-foot walls. Aaron could hear grunts and snorts all around her. The room was packed with livestock, pigs and cattle, some old and some very young, but all in pens and cages. They began to respond to her presence and, in a matter of seconds, she could hear them calling out across the length and breadth of the floor. Their noise was sure to bring Hewitt. She looked desperately for another way out. There had to be one somewhere, but the first door she took led to a room full of pig cages. The second door seemed equally useless, opening into a long, narrow locker room with no other exit. Tall lockers ran down both sides of the room, reaching all the way up to the low ceiling. This was where the staff came and changed into their work clothes. It was also where knives were kept, the blades placed neatly in racks inside a couple of tiny alcoves. Moonlight bounced off the stainless steel edges, drawing Aaron towards their deadly sharpness. The panic-stricken girl had got so used to hearing the distant grinding of the chainsaw that when it suddenly stopped, she stopped as well. She stood stock still in the locker room, listening for any sign as to what Leatherface might be up to but she didn't have to listen very long before hearing his unmistakable, offbeat tread come charging down the staircase from the Kohler room. Taking one last look up at the row of knives, Aaron ran back out into the main hall, then round into the other room with the enclosed pigs. Leatherface knew this place well. They changed it, made it new, but it was still the same as when he used to skin animal heads, and he knew where she was. She could tell by the bleeding of the livestock that Leatherface was now on the main floor of the slaughterhouse. The chainsaw purred, not in its full fury as before, and Aaron hadn't been able to find a way out in time, but... The girl was hiding inside one of the tall metal cabinets in the locker room. It was one of the first unlocked cupboards she'd found, and she'd climbed inside. 
and now her entire attention was focused on the slim vent slats cut into the door. Her view was restricted almost to what was right in front of the locker, but she could hear everything. She could hear Leatherface crash mindlessly about the main hall, scaring the animals with his chainsaw, and his ugly bastard mask, and his subhuman raving. She could hear him open the locker room door, then stumble awkwardly inside, his shoes slapping concrete just yards from her. Then she could hear him stagger back out through the door again, but it was only when she was certain that he was heading away from the direction of her hiding place in the locker room that Aaron screamed at the top of her voice. Her cries echoed through every room, hallway, enclosure, and knockbox of the slaughterhouse, reverberating from wall to wall, driving the animals into a frenzy of night terror and telling Leatherface exactly where she was. Hewitt stopped dead in his clumsy tracks and drove his fat, psychotic ass straight back towards the open door of the locker room. He knew there was no other way out of there. She was finished. The second he stormed back into the locker room, Aaron fell quiet. She shivered, her whole body quaking with terror. She knew what she was doing, but couldn't believe she was actually doing it. Her thoughts and actions now had a distant quality to them, almost as if she were someone else, looking down at her own life, watching her insane behavior unfold. Hewitt was walking slowly, his footsteps almost nimble in the darkness but the leather soles of his shoes scuffed against the floor tiles. She knew he was looking at all the lockers, casting his sickly black eyes over each of them in turn. Left, right, left, right. His eyes roaming, probing, and searching. Each second brought him nearer to her, and the tension was almost unbearable. Everything, the whole day, the whole bloody nightmare had come down to this moment. What happened in the next few moments would determine whether Aaron lived or died. If her plan succeeded, then maybe the Hewitts could be stopped. But if it failed, no one would find out about them, and their string of murders would continue with as much certainty and efficiency as the pneumatic bolt stunner in the slaughterhouse. But first, she had to get her breathing under control. It was too loud. She was too damn scared. He stopped. There was rustling in one of the lockers. Rustling in the locker. Rustling in the locker. Her eyes widened. The footsteps were getting closer. She could smell the stench of death from his apron, shit from his ass, and the nauseating fog of mass bloodshed that lingered throughout the slaughterhouse. She knew he was listening. She'd never heard him be so silent, so quiet. He was listening for the rustling sound. She heard rattling and realized it was her teeth chattering. She put a hand over her mouth and tried to keep her jaw still. But it was so hard, and her knees were quaking inside her jeans. Oh, God, she'd never been this close to death before. There was no way out of the locker. If all he did was throw open the thin metal door and jam his massive, repugnant body in the way, she'd be finished. She'd made it so easy for him. Now he was opening the lockers, throwing the doors wide open, making the metal shake and clatter, his own mask encased wheezing, adding fuel to the fire of imminent onslaught. One locker, another heat was getting closer. She shut her eyes tightly and fought back the terror that seemed sure to engulf her, if his violent, bloody mayhem didn't completely destroy her first. He raised a bloody hand up to the next locker, but there was a loud bump in the locker behind him. Aaron stared out through the vent and could have wept in utter despair as she saw him spin on his heels and rip-start the fucking chainsaw. The roar of the engine was deafening inside the cramped locker room. The rows of metal doors made the place into a bloody echo chamber. But even though the brutal din rode roughshod over the sound of Aaron hyperventilating, it was too late for her. Leatherface had heard the bang in the locker, and he knew exactly where to look. Livid with excitement, he raised the chainsaw ready to inflict maximum overkill on her face, and then grabbed at the locker door. He shook and rattled the latch with fumbling erratic fingers, his hand smearing dirt on the chrome finish. Then finally he opened the door and screamed. The exhaust burned and the cutting chain turned, rev, 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 but she wasn't there. Instead, a baby sow rooted through some work clothing lying on the locker floor. Aaron had taken the animal from the adjacent room only a couple of minutes ago, and now she had Leatherface just where she wanted him. She could see his massive, stinking back through the ventilation slats in her door. 
He was standing, looking into the locker directly opposite hers, bearing down on the small pig she put there as a decoy. His back was turned towards her, sweating, heaving. If Hewitt had taken the trouble to look more closely when he first entered the locker room, he might also have noticed that something was missing from one of the tool racks. And now his back was facing her, and she was holding a meat cleaver in her right hand. Slowly, carefully, she began to open the door. And for one coldly calculating moment, she enjoyed his confusion. She'd put the piglet in the locker. She'd laid the bait, and now Leatherface had taken it. He didn't know what was happening. He just ranted and fired up the chainsaw over and over. He was too damn stupid to realize it was time for the slaughter man to get some payback. Aaron crept forward behind Leatherface, raised the cleaver and... Reflection. Mirror inside the locker. Girl behind. Girl in the mirror. Behind. Behind. Leatherface turned and screeched as the cleaver came down with every ounce of strength Aaron could muster. He hauled the chainsaw across to deflect the blade, but in the narrowness of the room his bulk worked against him. He was too big, too clumsy, too... The meat cleaver hat clean through his right forearm. Blood. The blood of Thomas Brown Hewitt. Blood of the maniac. Blood of the murderer. Blood of the psychopath. Blood of the skinner, the butcher, the cannibal. Blood of the freak. The blood of Leatherface. The chainsaw sputtered, spat, and fumed. The pig ran out from under his feet and away. Leatherface looked down at his arm, badly cut and pouring with blood. His face, as Kemper was emotionless, but his eyes were furious with expression. The shock was nothing. She was nothing. His insanity would not be denied. He, the cleaver, hit him again. Aaron snarled and buried the vicious steel in exactly the same place, plowing through the same crimson furrow and cutting right through the bone. Suddenly, his forearm fell limp, pulled down by the weight of the saw gripped tightly in his right hand. But the arm was no longer connected to the elbow by any muscle tissue, and the bone was gone, clean cut through. Blood was everywhere. The arm bit down at an unnatural angle, 90 degrees the wrong way to the body, and then it was gone. Leatherface howled as his right forearm fell to the floor, still clutching the chainsaw, his fingers locked on the gas. The moment the whole gruesome assembly hit the ground, it span out of control, the severed arm and the chainsaw turning round and round with the revving of the engine, spinning insanely within a spiral of exhaust fumes. Aaron jumped back, the whirling saw blade almost hitting her feet, and stared at Hewitt's bloody stump in disbelief. She had hurt him. She'd hurt him real bad. And no one but the young woman could have understood the beady cocktail of emotions that flowed through her at that very moment. She was feeling anger, hatred, terror, vengeance, joy, success, and power. She wasn't the fleeing victim anymore. She'd proved he wasn't almighty or invulnerable. She had taken the fight back to him and beaten him. What could he do with his arm? that had been crudely amputated. His chainsaw was whining out of control on the floor. Just who the hell did he think he was playing God with people's lives? Aaron raised the cleaver to finish him off when she remembered Andy. The hanging boy had begged her to kill him and it had almost killed her. She couldn't do it, but she had to. She'd taken a long knife and stabbed him through the chest and part of her had died with him. But here, now, she wanted to take the cleaver and chop the mental Hewitt bastard up into a thousand bloody pieces. Fear and anger had completely overwhelmed her, and now she was acting purely on survival instinct, wasn't she? Leatherface had no such doubts. Weeping and whining, his whole body shivering with psychosis, he placed a heavy boot down on his own severed arm, stomping on the bleeding butchered limb to keep it from moving any further. Then he reached down with his left hand and picked up both the unfeeling arm and the raging chainsaw. Aaron came at him again, but he was so much larger than she. She lifted the cleaver to hit him across the chest, but he punched her across the face with his severed right elbow stump. His moist flesh and ripped shirt dragged over her lips, spilling the warm fluid of his gash into her mouth. Aaron fell back, trying to spit the nauseating shit out off her tongue. 
This gave Leatherface the time he needed to pick up the chainsaw and slam it against one of the lockers, shaking the cutter free from the post-mortem grip of his dead right hand. The useless limb fell to the floor, giving him full control of the weapon. Erin stilled herself for another attempt. She lifted the cleaver, testing its weight in her hand, then moved forward, screaming, determined to kill. Too late. The psycho-freaking maniac had the chainsaw in his left hand and was swinging it high up around his body, howling, squealing, slinging the power tool in lethal erratic orbits all about him, tracing deathly patterns of exhaust blade, homicide, and an impossible barrage of death. The saw was everywhere and she couldn't get near him, and now she could see that the full fury of his bubonic, syphilitic eyes were tuned upon her. Even maimed Leatherface was still the darkest nightmare of senseless murders that she could ever hope to imagine. And now her fight was hopeless. He raged at her and screamed. He hurled the chainsaw wildly over his head in a pure display of destructive madness. Leatherface was degradation. Leatherface was despair. Erin ran for her goddamn life, out of the locker room and onto the main floor of the slaughterhouse. There had to be another way out of there, and this time she would find it. She still held the cleaver, but was no longer under any illusion that she could ever be a match for him. But at last she'd won one round of the fight. No, she'd done more than that. She disfigured the bastard. If nothing else came out of this execrable day, Thomas Brown Hewitt would be maimed for the rest of his wretched, miserable existence. He could go back up to the farmhouse and compare stumps with old Pappy, thanks to Aaron. You're welcome. Leatherface welled. He cried. He screamed. He came after her. He stopped. At first, his whole body had been shaking with rage, but after a few labored steps, he began to stumble until finally, the chainsaw fell out of his hand and crashed onto the floor where the engine purred and sputtered, the chain disengaged and meaningless. He dropped to his knees and then fell back against the lockers, and soon he was on the ground moaning and clutching at his bloody stump. He was quivering, pathetic, bleeding. At the end of the day, Leatherface was left sitting in the locker room, a subhuman alone among all the animals of the slaughterhouse, cowhide on his feet, human hide on his face, only you won't find human hide in any dictionary. Aaron had shown that even stalkers bleed, and that the biggest enemy she'd had to confront was fear, not some deranged, retarded cripple with a chainsaw. Hewitt had tried everything to impose his violence upon her, and he had failed. He had killed her friends, changed her life, driven her half insane, and yet she lived. Aaron lived. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 15 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake. Uh, sorry that there was like a week off there uh, since the last chapter, but I went out to uh, Transworld up in St. Louis over this past weekend, and I was getting prepared for that last week. It was a Halloween haunt uh, convention, but uh, I got to meet uh, the guy that played Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Uh, you'll see his, uh, if you go, if you skip to the narration, you can go back to the beginning of this video and see a little shout out he did for the channel there at the beginning. Uh, but I hope you guys are enjoying this book so far. We're almost at the end. I think we've got maybe one more upload of this left. If not, it'll be two. Uh, we're right at the end, folks, and I'm really enjoying uh, the way Stephen Hand wrote this book. Um, 
yeah, novelizations have to pretty much stay true to the movie, and this one hasn't added a whole lot of extras or changed much, but uh, he's made it exciting and made it feel fresh, and uh, I really love that fight between Aaron and Leatherface there in the slaughterhouse. Uh, the fact that he gets his arm chopped off is so brutal, and uh, you think that he's just going to keep going, and then finally, you know, he is human, and uh, everything catches up with him. But we all know what's coming next, if you've seen the movie. If not, I won't say anything. I'll be back very soon with more of this book, probably the conclusion. And uh, until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. <laughs>